Our guest today, he was sworn in four years ago at 10 o'clock, and at noon he was here, right here. So we're enormously grateful at the City Club. And now as he's uh, preparing to leave in a few months, he decided to give his kind of, he opened the door with us and now he's kind of closing the door with us. And so before I uh, get into the introduction, I want to thank you, Kurt, and let's give him a round of applause. Our guest today is the treasurer for the city, city of Chicago. He has served as treasurer for four years. He is the steward of the city of Chicago's $8 billion investment portfolio. Our guest today also serves as a trustee or fiduciary on four of the city's public employee pension funds with nearly $25 billion under management. He is a lifelong Chicago resident and a graduate of Whitney Young High School. Our guest today earned his undergraduate degree from Washington University and his MBA from Harvard Business School. And he is so smart that he has his wife, Helen, with us today. And let's give her a City Club welcome. <laughs> Helen, thank you. And his two sisters, Sharice and Kirby. Sharice and Kirby, say hi. Don't be shy. And his brother-in-law, Brandon. Ladies and gentlemen, Kurt Summers. Kurt. All right. I'm looking for the uh, clicker here for this, unless somebody's just clicking in the back. OK. Um, well, thank you to Jay and Jackie and the board and distinguished guests. Um, Thank you for braving the cold and uh, the snow. Uh, let's think about it this way, at least it's not Wednesday, right? Um, I also want to take uh, a minute and thank the three candidates running for treasurer. This is the first time we've had a competitive election for that race in over three decades. So congratulations to all of you. Um, we thank you all for, for being here and for your, for your service. Uh, I have so many, thank you, Jackie. I have so many friends in the audience, so many people that have been a part of my life and my work for a long time. Uh, one person that Jay didn't mention that I have to mention at the outset, I think he was leaving that for me, which is appropriate, because uh, 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 otherwise I'd be a bad son, is my mother, Sherry, who's here. <clears throat> So, so since we have such a, a close group with us today, and since we have, uh, since it's cold outside, I thought we'd get cozy uh, and, and hang out a little bit and have really a conversation. It's a conversation that many of you uh, I've been having with uh, since I announced that I'm not running for treasurer uh, for re-election uh, or, joining, or joining the uh, Game of Thrones that's become the mayor's race. <laughs> Um, many of you, I'm just getting started, folks. Um, <laughs> ma many of you have asked me or engaged with me on three common topics. Uh, the first topic is we are so happy for Helen. Uh, we're so excited for her. Let's give her another round of applause. We're so happy that she gets her husband back for a while. She didn't know that's why that was coming. That's why she's. <laughs> Uh, the second is, what's my read on the mayor's race and the current political climate? <laughs> Winter is here. Uh, and then the third, to quote my favorite television president, Josiah Jed Bartlett, what's next? <laughs> Today I want to have a conversation with all of you about where we are and what's next. And as I prepare for what President Obama called our most important job going forward, being an engaged citizen. When I came to this uh, August group a little over four years ago on my first day in office at noon, just after being sworn in, I discussed how I wanted to transform the city's, city treasurer's office and invest in our Chicago. I talked about how we needed to change our priorities, our processes, our people, and even the proposed mandate of the office. We needed to think differently about the office. We needed to make our money work for us 
We needed an investor, a banker, and an advocate in that office working for the people of Chicago. The next year, I talked about <clears throat> the sometimes lost and forgotten power of our 77 neighborhoods, how we've engaged them differently, gave them a voice at the table, identified their issues, and helped create solutions and a policy-making agenda to help address working people in neighborhoods. Together, we, could, we proclaimed that we are 77 proud, that the fabric of this great city is a patchwork quilt of different ethnicities, different genders, different races and religions, different backgrounds that are brought together with one common purpose. It was then that we laid out our mantra for the office. You can see in the top corner, it's on the top of every billboard, there's a bunch of people here that work in the treasurer's office, it looks familiar to them. That acronym stands for, that, that spells H-D-Y-H-P-T, stands for how did you help people today? That has been the mantra and the guiding uh, principle, the true north, if you will, for our office for the better part of more than four years. The following year, we made the case for local investment, highlighting the natural assets, the tremendous companies and investment opportunities that are available to us, laying out that while we had a mandate to invest everywhere in the world, in South America, in Western Europe, in Eastern Asia, we had a mandate to invest everywhere, but in the third largest market and the largest economy in the world, which happens to be our own backyard. We have 0% at the time to invest there, right here in Chicago, where for too long, we had dismissed local businesses and entrepreneurs because of an agency problem, because of a history of corruption and a concern for salacious media headlines. We made it clear that this type of investment malpractice was, was an absolution of our fiduciary duty, and it would stop now. Two years ago, we began to lay out some of our midterm accomplishments, like growing our revenue by roughly 150% and announcing that we would launch Chicago's first ever local investment fund. I'm happy to tell you today, unofficially, we've got you know, my, my council and staff here, so they won't let me tell you the official numbers, but when we came in office, uh, our revenue for the office was about $48 million. In 2018, we will have exceeded $150 million of revenue, generating over $100 million more revenue for the city of Chicago every year. That's $100 million less taxes, that's $100 million less fees, less fines, less burden on working families. It was there that we took the opportunity to highlight some tremendous community leaders, corporate leaders, and nonprofits that we've worked with along the way, showing that government can't do this alone and that these partnerships with all of you are needed for this city to succeed. And last year, we took on the level of disparities that we see in this city, especially across racial lines, looking at virtually every metric, household income, poverty rates, home ownership, home values, net worth, you name it, Despite being a significant economic powerhouse, Chicago has some of the largest racial disparities anywhere in the country. There's something unique about this place that we consider the norm. And not at all normal, but it's become our way of life and our social and cultural expectation. And now in the winter of our discontent, the election for our next leader is upon us. Doesn't that look like the Game of Thrones uh, thing? <laughs> so, in the midst of this, I wanted to provide you a message. And it's a message that may cause some of you discomfort today. But I feel my job, as they say, is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. My hope is that you'll leave here with the same affliction that I have that no longer allows you to see your status quo as normal, that acknowledges that sitting on the sideline, even in our everyday life, and not being part of the change is not an option. But here's the comfort. See, I believe that in many ways, Chicago itself has an affliction. It's been described by all of us as the Chicago way in books like American Pharaoh 
or boss or at our dinner tables and Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving. The Chicago way which has led to this racial inequity, to corruption, to government spending run amok, to a lack of affordability for working people and working families. My message to you today is that the solution to Chicago problems, nor unlocking its vast potential, will, its vast potential will be unlocked or found on the ballot box on February 26th, or more likely April 2nd. You won't find a silver bullet amongst this motley crew. What we need is a new Chicago way. We need a full scale change. We need a cultural revival. We need a new value proposition for Chicago and not just a new mayor. And while the leadership on the fifth floor matters, they will all fall woefully short of the mark unless we, as an engaged citizenry, change our ways. When this headline came out in 2015, this editorial, I called and I demanded a retraction. I called my friend John McCormick, and I, I said, this is abhorrent, it is distasteful, and you are tone deaf to allow this to be printed on your pages. I still believe that. The premise of this editorial, though, was that Chicago needed and still needs a figurative rebirth. In some respect, we need to relearn our motor skills. We need to relearn how to walk and talk, how to behave amongst each other in society. Because much of what we've learned is not appropriate. It is not normal. And to the rest of the world, it is not a compelling value proposition. See, I keep using this term normal, and I know we all define normal and normality differently. Your normal is not my normal. Empirically, when we talk about normal, we show a normal distribution in a data set like this. <clears throat> but in Chicago, we don't operate within the normal distribution. We operate on the tails. See, for all the great things that we have, a $700 billion gross regional product, the number one location for foreign direct investment, the number one location for site selection and corporate relocation, the incredibly low unemployment rate at the macro level, we have an overwhelming number of, of issues weighing down the other side of the curve here, the negative tail, if you will that makes what we do in Chicago and makes the Chicago way far from normal. Last year, we showed you this chart that spelled out on the issue of household income, something unique happens in Chicago. Household income for white families goes up, for black families, Asian families, and Latino families go down when compared to the United States average. Seen another way, if you look at the buildup of the household income, white families make $70,000, Asian families $56,000, Latino families $41,000, and black families at the bottom $30,000. This is the level of our disparity, and it's far greater than the rest of the United States. You'll also remember, remember from last year, the same is the case with income poverty, the same is the case with unemployment rate. Something unique happens in Chicago, and it's far from normal. When we look at the facts, we must ask ourselves, with income inequality, pop, poverty disparity, the unemployment rate difference, Home ownership rate differences, white families 57%, black families 35%. Home values, white families $275,000, black families $140,000. Business values, businesses owned by white proprietors, white proprietors are 12 times the value of businesses owned by black proprietors. And I say this as a grandson of a guy who started a business that my mom now thankfully runs through generations. 
Credit scores in neighborhoods that are predominantly white are nearly 200 points higher than neighborhoods that are predominantly black in Chicago. We've all seen the stats around the educational achievement gap. And we need only look at the recent outcomes of uh, the Laquan McDonald case and the officers who were charged with covering up to see that there is bias in our criminal justice system. But it doesn't just stop there because that's really showing disparity with one group or two groups of people. In Chicago, our homicide rate per capita is 24 per 100,000. In LA, it's seven. In New York, it's three and a half. That means the, the city of New York's homicide rate is seven times less than ours. The city of LA, three and a half times less than ours. Something is happening in Chicago and it is not normal. Unfunded pension liabilities, we know what they are, 30 billion, not counting the schools. Total debt per household, now this is actually a whopper. In the city of Chicago, we have over $80 billion of total, uh, total debt. That means more than $60,000 per household. That number is greater than the annual average household income in the city of Chicago. Now, which financial advisor in this room would recommend any family to live with a level of debt, a multiple of their income? Zero. Why is it okay for Chicago? Our credit rating, we haven't seen an A rating for our bonds in years. Our interest rating, the cost of our debt for the Chicago public schools has, ex has hit the boundary in the last three years, hit the boundary of what is allowable for a municipality to issue at. The, the, the rate we can't exceed. Affordability with one third of the people in Cook County being working poor or in poverty. The regressive taxation that exists, harder and higher effective tax rates for working class and, and, and middle class people in Chicago and upper class people. The rubber stamp city council, no offense aldermen, 43, I guess both aldermen, 43 of the 50 members of the city council vote in lockstep more than 90% of the time. That is not discourse. That's not a legislative body, that's not debate, that's conformity to the Chicago way, which is not normal. And an egregious lack of public engagement on virtually every major project, major decision that has, that has hit our city in the last several decades. This is, this, is, this is an important point. The value proposition for Chicago has led to us from be becoming the third largest city, soon to be the fourth, versus our moniker, the second city. Because in the last half century, we've lost nearly a million people. We've gone from being the second city in size to soon being the fourth. And it's because of this lack of value proposition. And it's difficult for us to uh, retain or attract new people because here's what they see. By the way, thankfully, we have a great controller now, Aaron Keen. I'm not going to read these. They're all too familiar to everyone here. This is what the world is seeing about Chicago. This is what our young people are seeing about its own city. Why would they want to come back here? Why would they want to come live here and bring their family here? Why would they want to raise children here? Why is this? our normal. This is my favorite. <laughs> this is a little bit like a therapy session, guys, so I'm, gl I'm glad this it's an intimate setting. We need to have some real conversations with ourselves and do some soul searching and, and, and come to grips with the fact that we are 
heavily in the negative tail of the things that would be considered normality in any country, any place that you would design, would you design headlines like that? Would you design economic conditions like that? Disparity, inequality, inequity like that? No, you wouldn't. So why stand for it? Because we're going to have a great savior come in the upcoming election? This is like the, uh, the uh, documentary Waiting for Superman. He or she are not coming. But there's hope. There's hope around the corner. There's hope in this room. There is a solution and there are answers to what is clearly uh, a myriad set of problems. The answer is you. The answer is not who takes on the fifth floor, although leadership is important. The answer is you. You are and you create our value proposition. You are and you create real accountability in this city. You are why we should all have faith. You are the proof that we are better than this. You are uniquely made for this moment. And there are some examples that I can think of, of people, uh, one of which is actually in this room. I saw Michelle. Where is she? There she is. Let's give Michelle who runs uh, MIGFA Challenge, a round of applause. Michelle from MIGFA Challenge, Jamal from My Block, My Hood, My City, Arnie Duncan and the work that he's doing with at-risk 7 to 25-year-olds, 17 to 25-year-olds. Tanika Johnson, who has showed, showed us what 7,900 South and 1,800 West looks like, versus 7,900 North and 1,800 West looks like in the Folded Map Project. Kevin Koval with Young Chicago Authors and my dear friend and memoriam, Brian Sleet, who worked with Chicago Votes in creating a new... <laughs> creating a new generation of civic leaders and those who believe in their purpose we have to be the exception to the rules that have governed us for the last half, central, half century. When I was preparing this, I was gonna say that there's a battle for the soul of our city, but in reality, there isn't a fight at all because the people in this room and outside of this room have not yet signed up, confirmed and dedicated themselves to the fight. We need to make sure that Chicago works for everyone and that everyone needs to work at it, everyone in this room and outside of this room. This is not an issue for people of certain races, genders, people who live in certain neighborhoods. It's an issue for all of us. We all have a vested interest in one another's success, in our collective success as a city. If nothing else, we have an interest in a tax pace that hasn't lost a quarter of its population. If nothing else, we have an interest in having a community that we can live, work, and play in safely, and that our children and grandchildren can grow and thrive without concern for their safety and, and, and with an opportunity for a great education. In order to do that, starting in this room, the people in this room have to think different. We have to vote different. We have to hire different, engage different, invest different, budget differently. We have to treat the world and the city of Chicago as though there are no sacred cows. We have to take risks, invest in, in both candidates and causes, have difficult conversations with each other, with our family members, with our police officers and firemen, with our city workers, uh, and those who are working in, in ivory towers downtown. We have to call out injustices and pre prejudices. We have to go to other neighborhoods, restaurants, and places of worship. We have to ask ourselves, how did you help people today? This isn't about a race. This isn't about a title. This isn't about a perch that sits on a floor of an old building. This is about our culture. 
This is about our habits, our values, our integrity, and our practices. We have to begin asking not just who can win a race, or as John Cass would say, who do we need to suck up to now? <laughs> Let's start asking what's the best way to run this city? How can we help the most people? What are the solutions that we've been too scared to address and ignore? We cannot sit idly by in silence. We can't close our eyes and act like it's gonna go away. Over the weekend I was in North Carolina with my nephew who next month will be two years old. And when he didn't like something or didn't like the situation, sometimes he'd throw a tantrum. But when he didn't do that, he'd close his eyes as though it went away. Whatever the problem was went away. So we can understand that from a two-year-old, but not from a group of people in this room. We know better. We know that when we're silent, when we close our eyes, when we sit idly by, when we ignore injustices, when we don't stand up for what we know the problems are, the problem does not go away. Yeah. It gets worse. I was in North Carolina this weekend, and it was a great treat. Helen's dad gave a sermon. And when he finished the sermon, I said, that's the way I want to finish on Monday at the City Club. We were all down there. And these are, the, these are the words I want to leave you with. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the groups of people I need to say thank you to, just very quickly, uh, when I say your name, just stand. Trip, Pete, Asher, Natalie, Karita, Alex, Sonia, Jabari, Mary Christine, James, Drew, Alex. These are all folks who have been working for you for the last four years. Rachel, stand up, Rachel, who have been working for you, public servants whose name will never be in the press, knock on wood who do it because they love this city and they decided to wake up every day and ask how am I going to help people today. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Treasurer. Where are you going? I'm going to go here. Oh, okay. So sometimes in the church, when the sermon is a little tough, you don't hear a whole lot of call and response. You didn't hear a lot of call and response today, but you heard a lot of, mm. You know, you heard a lot of people went, mm, because it kind of pinched a little bit, stepped on some toes, um, but made us more aware of some of the things that we probably already knew but hadn't stopped to think. So thank you for that, Treasure. Ready for the question? Let's do it. All right. Um, so the first one is a, is, is a, I think they used to call those softballs. Um, what is something that you did not get accomplished in your last five years? Uh, yeah, so uh, two things that I'm hoping Alderman Pawar and Alderman Irvin uh, help me with in the last four months or the next four months. One is um, making sure that our municipal depository ordinances change so that we can invest in community credit unions uh, and other forms of CDFIs and community banks and not just the large financial institutions. Uh, we made a significant and historic deposit in Illinois Service Federal um, about 18 months ago, 15 months ago, and uh, it was a shame that that $20 million deposit was the largest in their history. What's even more of a shame is that that's the only bank, only community bank, that we could really do that with. Uh, but with the help of Alderman Pawar and Alderman Irvin, hopefully we can change that. The second thing is, last year, we... Uh, we took on a leadership role with the rest of the nation um, in making sure that 100% of our investments go through a, a rating 
of ESG, environmental, social, and governance scoring, so that everything that we invest uh, scores what the risks are to the environment, what the risks are to society, what the risks are to, to uh, poor governance, uh, and ultimately to the investment that we make on behalf of taxpayers with that $8 billion portfolio. We've done that. We, we were the first city in the country to do it. We're the first city in the world to sign the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing. And now we need for Alderman Poir and Alderman Irvin uh, to sign that into law so that the next treasurer will do the same thing and build on that work. There is a wave of um, younger people. I guess my gray says, how, shows how old I am, but there's a wave of younger people that have some fabulous ideas about this city. And um, I just think that they ha need to have a platform where they're heard. Um, we try to expose and, and display as many of them at City Club, but um, the treasurer is certainly one of them. But the next person is also another. His name is Xavier Ravy, Ramey, and he is the CEO of Justice Informed. Xavier, wave your hand. So I'm going to try to read this, and I hope I get this all right. Several years ago, you invested. This is to you. Several years ago, you invested $10 million into a black-owned bank in Chicago. You already talked about that. Localized support from mega institutions play a pivotal role in neighborhood growth in a city with a downtown strategy. Have other asset managers followed your example, and what's a challenge to them? Yeah, the rest of it I can't read. Can you help me out with the rest of that? Um, you know, some of it is education, knowing that, that uh, that's an opportunity for them to have a real impact. Uh, I will say that since we made that investment, uh, the state treasurer made a significant uh, deposit with ISF, uh, as did the Obama Foundation. Um, and I know that several other uh, large companies and small companies have put their capital with that bank and served as a catalyst. But I, I think that the question that you're asking is exactly what we want to spark in this kind of conversation, which is if you are sitting at Firm X and you are indifferent, if, if, if the return that you get on your capital, right, or the security of your capital, if you're getting just what cash pays and you can get that same amount anywhere and you have an ability to have an impact by putting that capital with a local Chicago-based community bank in a neighborhood, some portion of that capital, why aren't you doing it? Why haven't you asked that question of your CFO, treasurer, controller? And if you haven't and you've never thought of it, here is the point in which you've been educated. And this afternoon or tomorrow or this week or in the year 2019, you can make it your purpose to ask that question and others like it. But I think it's exactly the right kind of question we need to ask. Representative Buckner, where are you? Oh, I'm looking right past you. Congratulations and uh, welcome to the game. Um, representative Buckner is the new uh, rep state representative for the 26th district. You can wave your hand. I don't know if we got you earlier. <laughs> so his question says, it appears that legalization of marijuana is imminent. However, it remains illegal federally, making it difficult for those involved in the industry to, break, to, bank, to open banks and undertake typical financial transactions. Could a public, state, or city bank be in the answer? Yeah, I think absolutely. It's one of the things that's come up uh, in both the mayor's race and the treasurer's race. Uh, the concept of the public bank, not just for that purpose, for, but, but for others. I think the, uh, the issue in my just view on public bank, and I've, and I've spoken with the candidates about this, um, if Chicago has a public bank, Chicago has to be prepared to foreclose. Chicago has to be, be prepared if they give a mortgage to foreclose on a home, if they give an auto loan to repossess a vehicle, if they give a student loan to put a lien on that student's assets. That's the, the other side of the coin for the public bank. Now for a sole purpose, like to support an industry, um, I think that it's possible you have to be prepared to do the same thing. Banks have to be prepared just in general to be handed the keys, right? whether it's a home or any other asset, a business. And 
um, we would have to have a real discussion with each other about whether we are prepared to be in that business. Another op option is to find uh, banks that are willing to, credit unions are willing to, CDFIs even that are willing to, or other alternative lenders who are willing to do that uh, on the basis of, of a link deposit with your capital for that specific purpose. <coughs> no different than the state of Illinois does with the ag industry today. This is, by the way, just another agricultural product, so, or will be shortly. So I think that uh, that's probably the easiest way to, to transition into that and make sure that there's funding and financing. Uh, um, but to make sure that there's equity, you have to find those financial institutions, not just in downstate with your legislative colleagues, but those on the south and west sides of Chicago uh, where there, are, there have been for decades entrepreneurs in that business. Angie Love is way with words. Entrepreneurs in that business. Rendell Solomon is managing director of Muller and Monroe. Um, wave your hand, Rendell. Um, his question says, and he is a city club member, by the way. Thank you for your service, first of all. How do you ensure that the Illinois and Chicago pension funds continue their efforts to support, to support diverse investment manager, managers when strong advocates like yourself step down from the posts as trustees? Yeah. Can I just have this for a second? Yeah. First of all, I want to appreciate the, the well thought out, pre planned question here. Let's take notes on this city club member. Um, I think it's a fantastic question. It is a fact that leadership matters. It is a fact that Ariel wouldn't have gotten its first investment if Cecil Partee wasn't the treasurer of the city of Chicago at the time. It is a fact that leadership matters. And, and uh, part of what the message today was, was really a question to this group and this, this team of people here inside and outside the room, how can we be a better accountability mechanism to those that we put in office? So all three treasurer candidates are here today. All three of them need to hear, this was the standard that was set we expect you to do that and more. And they need to hear that in unison, in uniform fashion with, with everyone. This, the Senate also lost a great champion in, in our Attorney General, Kwame Raul, on this issue. And I think there can be a void of leadership if the people in this room and outside of this room don't hold the folks in those, that are coming into those positions accountable. I have a really good question from Graham Grady, but before I ask that question, Dr. Whitaker wrote that. Now, I, you can't read yeah, that. Yeah. Is it the doctor thing? I, what does the question say, Dr. Here we Whitaker? Go. How do you create a pathway to institutionalizing a new Chicago? Really? Way? You can read that? That's my, that's my partner there. I, um, man. Is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. You, you get. I, yeah, because right now you're saying it's you. That's right. But that needs to be a, yeah, I'm just trying to read it. <coughs> so I'm with you 100%. The, the question was, how do you create an institutional pathway to a new Chicago way, to what we discussed here today? How do we leave this room and then there's something that people can attach to and say, I've got this idea or I need this resource. Where do I start? Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer to that is I don't know. But um, it's also the answer to uh, Jed Bartlett's question, what's next? For me, this is going to be uh, the mission and purpose of my life, uh, not just in the months to come, but in the years and decades to come, uh, to, to help create and find that platform for others, to have resources, to provide ideas. And I don't believe that that platform needs to or even should reside within government. I think that is the issue. I think the accountability and the ownership needs to be, be uh, of and for and by the people. And you know, with your help over the next several months and thereafter, hopefully we can create that together. Um, this question is from Thomas McElroy. Graham, I have not forgotten your question. Um, what steps can be made 
um, or in place for minority certified firms um, in the public sector. What ideas do you have? Uh, firm to get bridge capital for the public sector contracts. Next they time want. I was going to let you moderate your. Is that right, <laughs> Thomas? Okay. So here's an idea for the three treasurer candidates and for anyone that's, you know, in the camps of any of the mayoral candidates or anyone that works at a financial institution, because you don't need government to do this. For those who are vendors that are small, minority, women, disabled, veteran-owned businesses, whatever it is, okay, if you have such, such a classification, it means that your access to capital has been challenged in the past, uh, and we need to find ways with this new lens to enable you in the future. If you are doing business, business with the city, county, or state, the reality is the bridge that is required isn't your credit risk, it's our credit risk. It's not, it's not the risk, the long-term risk of your business because you're, we're just bridging you until we pay you, right? So it's the risk of us not paying you. It's, it's our credit risk. So any treasurer candidate, any mayoral candidate, anyone who's supporting those folks, anyone who is at a bank who wants to be forward-leaning, forward -leaning, progressive, and forward-thinking, find the way to bridge and attach the demand and need, the short-term funding need, where there is a certified contract, where there is an invoice out and a payable and a receivable due, find a way to finance that against the credit of the city of Chicago, city of Chicago, County of Cook, State of Illinois. If you do that, for the small business owners in this room, just nod your head if that will help. Yeah. Okay. It's not rocket science. It's been done at CPS. It's been done at, at CHA in pilot programs, it can be done by larger institutions. It can be done with or without government. So Graham gets um, some sort of a prize today because you're asking the question that everyone in the room wants to ask that hasn't. Um, and he just says very clearly, why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? So he says, today you outlined the city's challenges. Why won't you stay and help address these challenges? Or do you plan to serve in a new capacity? That looks like a great one to end on. It is. It's the last one. All right. Um, thank you, Graham, always with, with good questions. Um, despite, uh, what's the Mark Twain quote? Like, uh, reports of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Um, <laughs> despite. Uh, Fran Spielman's insistence that I'm retiring at the age of 39. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. I've lived in the same zip code my entire life. Uh, I will be in Chicago. I will be visible in Chicago. I will be leading with all of you in my most important role as engaged citizen. Uh, after I take a little break from office, um, you know, I may just be a pain in the ass for the people who want my job or want the other job. But I'm going to be visible. I'm going to be engaged. Don't worry, it will be constructive. Um, and after a couple of months of uh, uh, spending some time with my, my wife and, and hanging out, uh, I'll figure out you know, what the next step is and, and sort of which opportunity that's come my way I want to pursue. But uh, uh, I'm not going anywhere.